How, how's that for a picture? It looks good. It looks good. Is that all right? Yeah, I, I set mine up so it looked like I'm Kathy Bates. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're going to make the kind of book I want. <laughs> no. Should we just go right into it and just? Yeah, you... yeah, sure. Just tell me what you have in mind. All right. So, what I had in mind is uh, this is the first of a limited series of podcasts that Mickey Dolan's over here, depending on which side of the screen it's going to pop up on, um, who is the author of a brand new book uh, called I'm Told I Had a Good Time that I'm the publisher of and editor of, that we would get together and we talk fairly often on the phone and we talk about all kinds of weird stuff. The other day, Mickey called me and was talking to me about UFOs and uh, the Manson family. And and so I thought, you know, these are the kinds of things that Mickey could go on hundreds of podcasts and probably will, and we'll never get to that because he's always establishing similar ground. People ask the similar questions, but I thought we would talk a little bit in these short little bursts about how we did the book, uh, what the discovery process was and some of the weird stuff that's in the book and maybe even some things that aren't in the book. Um, so now I get to let you talk, Mickey. Uh, how are you doing today? Very good. Good. Very good. well. Thank you. I'm back east in the uh, Philadelphia area. Yep. In an un undisclosed uh, location. Doing, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm in a safe house, I call it. <laughs> okay. Well, yes, I'm I'm in and at Beatland headquarters. And so what I thought we'd talk about a little bit today was what the genesis of the book was, was we were in Australia together and you were on tour with Michael Nesmith uh, and we were in an airport lounge and you, you said to me, you know, I think when we get back home, I'd like you to digitize my uh, films that I made during the 60s and 70s. You know, can you get those transferred to HD? And that was kind of the first indicator. Why, why me? Oh, well, why not? I mean, you are archivist support superior extraordinaire um and we've been working together for a long time so um i thought i could trust you with it <laughs> um and i needed somebody to uh, to help and that you know had some sort of a sense of of value and some sort of a sense of organization and i I knew that you have archived all kinds of stuff for all kinds of different people. So, yeah, and you you are such a really an expert on uh, on, well, a lot of things besides the monkeys, but on the monkeys vis-a-vis -vis your wonderful book, who, which I describe as it's not a coffee table book. It's the coffee table. Right. Well, I just and uh, it's like, so, a you know, so you add that all up one of those right seemed, here. <laughs> oh, you just happen to have it right there. What a coinky dink. And what's that mailing address? <laughs> it's beatlandbooks.com where you can pre-order a copy of Mickey's. Oh, look, you have a new book. It's called I'm Told I Get Time. Exclusively on offer as pre-order right now. And the, the the books will be shipping no uh no earlier, no later than December 6th. Although we're trying to get them in earlier. Um, because the because I got the other day, Mickey, it came in a big package. Look, you haven't even, I got, it's, whoa, it's a finished book. Oh my gosh. You got it. Is it a, a, a dummy book, a prototype, or is that it? This is it. This is a real one. Oh my God. Uh, how cool. Yeah. So, um, yeah. so anyway, I thought we would, we would talk a bit about it because um, it's available still. There's a limited edition. The There's the signed ones, the hardback ones, and there's these versions that are not limited, but We've got some uh, still in the store. And um, so we were talking about being in Australia. And then you, when we got back home, you said, you know, meet me at this spot to go go through the films. And you had the films laid out on a table. But then behind you were all these boxes of all this other stuff. And then, of course, I want to know what's in the other boxes of stuff. And that was like mostly stuff that's now in this book. But it was a, a like two or three year process. Yeah, it was a, a long process and a lot longer for me collecting the stuff because for some reason I never really had a a plan or a goal or <clears throat> you know a project like this in 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 mine really. I just kept stuff and I'd get a well the photos of course you keep and the ne and the negatives I caught I kept, um, but stuff from my childhood that I ended up with uh, from my parents after they passed um, and. Uh, stuff you know the weird stuff that I would I would just keep never thinking oh well, one day this is 
going to maybe in the back of my mind, I thought, well, my kids or maybe my grandkids might enjoy going through a box of stuff. But when you started going through it and pulling things, you kept saying, oh, my God, this is incredible. You're not going to believe what I found. And I'm like, what? What in the world could? But you surprised me even. Uh, the stuff that you you dredged up from the bottom of a box. What was that thing that you found at the bottom of a box all kind of crumpled and you didn't think it was anything yeah. and it was an old piece of paper or something? Yeah, that was the, the uh, early drafts of your song, Randy Skousekit. I was, <laughs> was about to toss out the box. It's like, what's this crumpled stuff in the, in the bottom here? And so we have the stuff here in the book. I'll just these are your your pieces here where you're writing the song and then the, it's on the back of hotel stationery so i was able to date when it was and we've laid it on top this is a pages out of the new musical express which is one of the music weeklies in england and you you bought them had them in your hotel room and apparently for my forensic uh <laughs> research you were you were painting in your room you were using it as a drop cloth and so like you went to meet the Beatles the week that this issue came out, you bought it and you were coloring in the Beatles like, like any other fan would, you know, with stuff. Hey, so, it was the sixties, you know, <laughs> I know it's crazy though. Just that you, you know, then I was, it wasn't like, Oh, well, here's an old newspaper. It's like, well, let's see what what's in here. So I, I did a lot of investigative work, but you know, even like earlier stuff, I, I pulled this out to show people because you're a big science buff and this is your, your science notebook from, June 12th, 1958. Wow. Bones A9 Science. And yeah. um, your your family kept everything. So here's, you know, yeah. this is uh this is not what all 500 pages of the book are, but but <laughs> you, you you even put in parts from comic books and <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I was, I was uh, I was a science geek even even back then. Yeah. That's yeah. kind of what got me into science was, that, in fact, uh, I believe it was that class. Yeah, it would have been. And uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, and I'll never forget the science teacher, Mr. Mack. And um, he scared people. He was really stern. And in those days, you could be kind of kind of strict and, and um, you know, keep <laughs> law and order in the, in the classroom. And but he really fired up an already sort of existing uh, interest I had in science and boy he ignited it he fired it up and ever since then I've been you know quite a quite a science geek and you even talked about him in this English school express at school I was sent to the electric chair so, so oh yes that's right so one of the first <laughs> one of the first projects of the year of the semester was in science working with electricity and making an electric chair. And it was basically a little copper grid on the seat, a couple of wires hooked up to a little, you know, flashlight battery. And um, if you were really naughty, and <laughs> boy, if you got, if you try to get away with this today, <laughs> they'd just probably shoot you on sight. Um, yeah, if you were really naughty in the class talking or, or something, you had to sit in the electric chair and he had a little one of those old like Frankenstein lever, you know, uh, switches and you, you'd get a shock. It, it wasn't a, a shock shock. It was a flashlight battery or something. But, you know, uh, I never was in the chair. I was a good boy. And um, <laughs> but I understand I understand it's kind of like when you put your tongue on a nine volt battery to see if it's any good. Um that kind of thing, but I, I um, but I remember that, yeah, and yeah, he fired up my uh, interest in um, uh, science. It was great. Although you did get a, a D in, on this uh, report you did on light, it just says too big. Too what? Too big. Big? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it. <laughs> too big? <laughs> what does that mean? Well, I think we I should know. go back and maybe maybe dispute this now. Uh, but but yeah. yeah, there's all sorts of great stuff I found. And um, so we started with the films, got all those done, and then eventually you, you let me start looking through the other boxes, which were photos and stuff. I mean, the photos. A lot of fans saw. You know, um, I have a few things here, like you know, 
because you had a book out in um i think the 90s you did a book of like your little yeah. uh, these 126 prints and this was like a uh, kodak had these out as a sort of consumer format a sort of point and shoot no focus uh thing but what yeah. happened was um you know these get kind of faded and we have some of them from the prints in there but i found that you had all of these things of negatives and yeah um, the thing about these negatives is you can't um you can't scan them on a normal uh, scanner because they are the same size as 35 millimeter. But if you do, that chops off part of the image. So our friend Gary Strobel scanned a lot of these. Uh, we did a bunch of test scans and tried different things to get the images back in. And also a beautiful sort of like um, what they call the bleed on the on the images, because on these, you know, you see the white border. But on the negatives, there's all this other part of the image. So we have a lot of that. And in the book. Wow. A lot of things you were doing what they call in the camera, meaning, you know, you didn't have an editor outside of the camera. So you were actually in the camera shooting photos that you wanted in in continuity or succession. So, yeah, you would take a photo of each one of the monkeys, uh, including yourself. And like we put together some of that as some of these spreads. So if you look at the bottom of the negative, that's a selfie of you. But then you yeah. took David, one of Peter and one of. Michael and yeah. uh, the book is kind of heavy it's hard to, it's hard to manage getting it up on the screen but yeah you 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 were pretty clever I mean I didn't know if you were really thinking like oh I'm gonna have a strip of film and it'll be like one of each of us no never thought of it in in those terms it would have been well those little cameras had a four flash cube on the top and as you say point and shoot no focus or nothing I think I'm the first one to get one. Then we all did. And you'd put the little cube on top. And we just got in the habit, I did, of just going up four in a row of a lot of stuff. Just pew, 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 pew. <clears throat> and, um, and so that was more just, you know, a kind of coincidental. But it did give a, a sense of, uh, of a, uh, I don't know, a sense of moment, uh, shall we say. Well, you happened to be on a big tour that summer. I mean, when you got that, it was just you went to France uh, to shoot the episode with the monkeys, the monkeys in Paris. And then all of a sudden you're in England at Wembley and you're shooting pictures of Lulu and all the people backstage and Brian yeah. Jones off of a balcony because uh, he was hanging out in your hotel room. And and Ron Wood, who happened to be at the speakeasy when you, the Beatles had the party for you. And then you're back on tour. So you're shooting a lot. But you also you start getting into serious 35 millimeter photography around then too, and shooting that as well. So we have yeah. that. Yeah, I I, um, I guess probably when I got back to the States, but then I remember my ma a major um, uh, photography sort of uh, purchase was when I went to Japan. And um, uh, of course they had all this wonderful, wonderful equipment. And they they brought it all to my room because we couldn't leave our room because there'd been death threats, supposedly. And um, they brought all this uh, photography equipment, Nikon stuff, really mm -hmm. good high end Nikon stuff. And that's when I oh, my gosh, I got every lens you can possibly imagine, including this big fisheye lens. Yeah. Which, so uh, this, I, I, that's oh, yeah. Look at that. You took of Michael. Um, and there's some great fisheye. There's a fisheye one at the bottom of this page looking up at him on the, the set of 33 and a third revolutions per monkey. But I mean, your photography just took a big leap forward and um, it's incredible yeah. to see some of the images you caught. It's just beautiful. Yeah, so. it was great fun. Great fun for a, a long time, years. So the other day you called me up and you were asking me about um, footage of you at a UFO convention. Oh, yeah, because <laughs> my friend Elliot Mintz, uh, the incredible uh, uh, journalist, uh, I don't know what, how he describes himself these days, um, he um, and I, we're, we just became great friends, and he would show up every once in a while, we would hang out a lot, and one day, uh, I don't know who it was, um, said, let's go out to the Flying Saucer Convention at Giant Rock in California, in Southern California. And I was, you know, curious, of course, as we all are, and um, not a great believer nor a great disbeliever. Um, so he went out as, a, as, well, we both went out as kind of journalists, I with my film camera and him with um, his uh, microphone. He was taping interviews. I'm not sure if he was doing it 
for any particular show at the time. He 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 was on ABC News. He was on a radio station, and we went out. I took pictures, and he interviewed some of these people at the uh, convention. One particular person I remember um, quite clearly was a woman in a flowing white um, gown kind of thing with her hair had kind of like beads or things in it. And uh, she said her name was uh, Princess Viana or something from, um, uh, from Venus and she lived on Venus. And she was absolutely dead serious. And I remember at the time, even, I mean, I didn't say anything, uh, but I didn't want to be rude. But at the time, I was thinking, because of you know, my science uh, uh, interest, I said, oh, in my mind, I said, oh, so you live in an atmosphere of 480 degrees and pure ammonia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I didn't go to many of those conventions after that. Well, here's a picture of you with Elliot. This is on Elliot's TV show. And that's oh, your, right. your modular MOOC synthesizer. And um, you're sort of, I guess you must have gone on and demonstrated it. Um, it's funny, you're, I think your relationship goes back. Elliot used to write for the Free Press here in Los Angeles and wrote right. an article about why Mickey Dolenz is cool in 1967. <laughs> um, and you guys have been friends ever since. Um, you were You were saying the other day that you had gone down to the courthouse and we're shooting photos of uh, uh, the Manson trials too. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, of course, uh, as we all know, that was a huge, huge uh, uh, moment in time. Um, but again, uh, Elliot, as a journalist, he, I kind of went along with him as a photo journalist. He would call me up and say, bring your camera. Uh, we're going to go here, going to go there. And the uh, Manson trial, and I think he might have interviewed Vincent Buglosi uh, at the time, uh, but he, we went down. You couldn't get into the courtroom. It was just uh, ridiculous. But there was enormous crowds out in front of the courthouse, including uh, uh, some of his followers, um, some of the girl followers um, who were, had not been arrested. They had not been included in, in the, 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 uh, that horror um, and weren't arrested, but they were sitting on out in front of, uh, of the courthouse on the lawn um, and they'd all carve the little uh, X's in their forehead, remember, and shave their heads and stuff. And he was interviewing them and I was taking photographs and yeah, and I never, I didn't even remember that I kept them. Yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, the discovery process is long. Obviously, at a certain point, we had to cut it off and get what we could into 500 pages. And even that was a bit of a stretch. But, but we, you know, keep collecting, keep looking through for potential of doing the next volume of, of books. But I wanted to sort of touch on all these various different little aspects of our, of our, um, collaboration on this in this series and so I thought we got off to a pretty good start one other thing I I thought I'd mention was you see Elliot at the end of your new uh promo film that I made for shiny happy people if you go on YouTube which you're probably on if you're watching this um at the end you see you hang gliding into frame and there's Elliot with his ABC News camera because he interviewed you on uh, our local channel 7 here in LA um for that yeah yeah. Well, again, you know, we were great friends. We hung out all the time, but not necessarily uh, doing events or doing, uh, you know, professional stuff. Uh, we hung, we just hung out a lot at my house, at his house, wherever. And I would have just, I guess, called him up or told him I was going out flying and, or he would have called me and said, are you flying uh, this weekend? And, uh, you know, that's how it would have come about. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I was going to mention last thing was that when I was going through, you have, you also had like a home studio and you you archived a lot of audio tapes from the time you were really young. Um, but I found you were uh, a guest host on a public affairs call in radio show on like AM or whatever. It may have even been Elliot's show where you're taking calls about local issues. You're the host in about 1973. Wow. I don't even remember that. <laughs> wow. How cool. I'd love to hear that one. Yeah, you talk about, you know, um, freeways, congestion, and other public affairs people calling you up and um, 
it's, it's very interesting. So wow. more, to, more to come. Um, hopefully yeah. we'll be back with you uh, in a week or so with another a little uh, insert here for you. But um, hello from Los Angeles. And, um, and hello from uh, uh, in an undisclosed location in the middle of nowhere. Mickey will be on tour this week in the Midwest at various stops, so go see his show. I'll be back here waiting for the books, and uh, we'll see you all off in the distant future. Bye-bye. Bye.